Hi, I'm Mike Lacona. This is my wife, Debbie. We're going to talk to you a few moments about the matter of doubt. And what brought this on was the other day, our son-in-law, Nick Peters, uh, alerted me to a worship leader named Marty Sampson, who has begun to question, uh, ask some difficult questions and doubt whether Christianity is true. And um, so I, I told Debbie about it because she's really into worship music. And of course, she knew who Marty was. Um, and uh, she was watching, you were watching a lot of the comments, reading a lot of the comments. She was relaying them to me throughout the day. In fact, let me just read you a few here. One here says, hey, when's the book coming out? Is it about your journey from faith to doubt and a little bit of exposing Hillsong? Either way, you'll earn millions from that, more than what you get from those worship songs. Gotta provide for your son, right? There's another one says, can you show me your new album cover? Someone else said, spoiler, there's an upside down cross in it. Here's another one. This thing is really going from, I am losing my faith to I am becoming a world joke. I guess someone took his lollipop at Hillsong and he had a fallout with God. Got everything too early, too fast, too easy. First time he was faced with difficulty, with people's agenda, his faith crumbles. What a faith. Here's another one. Get off social media. Go outside tonight. Look up at that great full moon and the sky full of stars and say to yourself, did this all just happen or was this created? How did we get here? Go back to your childhood questions. As long as you're truly seeking God for answers and want to know the truth, he will reveal it to you. Lots of believers falling away. Last days. I mean, you were just sending me screenshots of some of these. Just amazing. Yeah, one, one person said, if you just learn TULIP, the five points of Calvinism, everything will make sense to you. Oh, yeah, that'll help. That'd answer all his questions. <laughs> um, and Marty replied, I don't, was this this morning or yesterday? Or? Um, th this was this morning. Okay, so this is uh, what, a reply from Marty, and he was interacting once in a while, I think you said. Uh, I, I'm not on Instagram, really, I'd never do it, but you're um, on I think I think this was a response to um, a couple of public figures that um, put, made posts that were critical of Marty and um, didn't reach out to him personally, but just, just made public posts very critical. Okay. So he responds, uh, names this one person and says, this person put me on blast in front of all your followers, never met you, never spoke to you in my life. I reply to you on your Instagram page, your response to me, silence. Mentions another person, says this person reposts, I put, reply to her on her page, her response, silence. I don't like for my comment. Many Christian leaders and influencers, all with a blue tick from Instagram, high-fiving and backslapping each other. Meanwhile, my DMs, like I said, I'm not on Instagram. Does that mean direct message? I think so. All right. Uh, meanwhile, my direct messages are full of Christians telling me they are wrestling with their faith, the same questions, and commending me for being so brave and speaking out and saying what they wish they had the courage to say. I, actually, when you showed me this comment, I, I admired that. And, and by the way, this isn't uh, this video isn't something. It's not uh, an, a defense for for Marty um, or a trashing of those criticizing him. Uh, this is kind of just, a, he, he's just one of uh, several who uh, Christians who have either left the faith or they're considering leaving the faith or they're having doubts. So there was another one recently, um, I kissed yeah. dating goodbye, that Joshua guy. Joshua Harris. Joshua he, Harris. He actually left Christianity and got a divorce. And hmm. it's, it's quite a bit different than I think what Marty's going through where he's actually you know. questioning his faith and hasn't left Christianity. Yeah, yeah. So look, I, I, I'm not one of those out there who likes to just respond to anything and everything that's happening, but I felt like I wanted to respond to the current situation because um, I have doubted. Um, that's just the way it, it has in the past. Um, so, uh, I want to just go ahead and talk about the, you know, there's differences in the way people, our personalities and our styles. And this is, this is kind of fun. You have mentioned this to me a couple of times. You were a worship leader yourself for, for, for several years. And what were some of the things that you noticed? Well, 
I noticed one thing that we noticed between the two of us um, was we are very different in, in worship. And one thing I noticed even in the comments, um, the comments to Marty, uh, that the slams were not just to him, but there was there were, were slams that were toward worship leaders in general mm -hmm. and, and worship ministry yeah. in general, worship music um, and um, uh, judgments of worship leaders and, and worshipers um, as if they're all just nothing but feeling. Um, they have no spiritual substance um, no theological grounding, no biblical knowledge, and things like that, that um, certainly I did not find to be the case um, with my worship colleagues. Um, those that I, I worked with, um, certainly I, I can think of a number of them that, that had very deep <clears throat> spiritual uh, relationships with the Lord and, and had a great deal of biblical knowledge and, yeah. and, and you can attest to that. Yep. Personally. Um, and plus, I mean, I'm not really into much worship music. I don't listen to it, but like Chris Rice and Sarah right. Groves, I love the, listening to them. Right. Um, but you know, there's, there's this, um, because of the difference in the way people are wired, um, I found myself having, having a foot in both, both camps being married to an academic and being a worship leader. Um, there's a misunderstanding, I think, between the two. Um, worship leaders tend to look at people who don't worship the way they do, who tend to be more like you, um, who, who aren't very expressive, um, and think you're nothing but head knowledge and there's just no feeling behind it. And people like you tend to think people like me or people who really get into worship are just a bunch of feelers and you know, um, don't have any, any depth, which you knew that wasn't true about me. Oh, uh, absolutely but, not. But not, you yeah. would tend to sometimes judge others and we would those I didn't know those never you didn't met, know yeah. and we'd have to have conversations about that and um, you know I think because we were married to each other it forced us to look at people differently um, but I had conversations with people worship leaders and and so forth where I had to defend the academics and the pastors who weren't you know, showing the same sort of exuberance as maybe the, the rest of the worship team was, was hoping they would. Um, and just explain to them that you guys worship in a different way. Yeah. And you worship when your head's in a book. And I can't tell you how many times you've come with some nugget you've just gotten out of the word and your face is aglow. You know, and it's, it's no different than when I'm at the piano singing and worshiping. It's, it's just a different way. Yeah. But, you know, I remember because it seems like forever, but I used to be a saxophonist. I majored in saxophone performance in college. Awesome jazz saxophone player, um, and if I may say so. <laughs> it's like I was a different person then. I remember, you know, I'd play. I could really worship and play and feel so close to God and... Um, you know, at that point when I'm playing a lot, it's like, well, people don't really need to hear a sermon. They can just go read a book and learn the same stuff. But now it's like, you know, two songs at worship on Sunday morning and I'm done. You know, let's sit down and let's get on with this thing. You know, you can listen to the music on a CD <laughs> or something. So, it, you know, I, I'm a different person now than when we met. Yes, you are. Um, but it's kind of like just where we're inclined. Our personalities or mm -hmm. interests are inclined at the time. And, and I agree with you, we, uh, we need to be careful about how we criticize those who are different than us, who have different tastes or emphases, focuses in their lives. Um, you know, my heart goes, when, when I was reading about Marty and you were telling me about him, my heart went out to him um, because I've doubted. 
uh, doubt it a lot. In fact, um, I remember it was 1989. We'd been married two years, probably. We were living in Baltimore at the time. And I was experiencing a crisis of faith. And uh, there was no email. So I, I called Gary Habermas, who I'd spoken with, I think, only once before. And he's a philosophy professor at Liberty University. And he calls it the Baltimore call. Mm -hmm. And it kind of went something like this. Doc, you, you know, there's a lot of scholars who don't think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the Gospels, and they say we have no idea who wrote them. The names weren't added until the second century, and if we have no idea who wrote the Gospels, then we don't know if we can trust them, and this is really causing me to question whether Christianity itself is true. And Gary listened patiently to me, and then he asked, did Jesus rise from the dead? And I said, yeah. He says, why do you believe that? I said, well, I've learned that argument that you gave. It's called the minimal facts argument. You take these facts, just a, a few of them, that are so strongly supported by the data that uh, even nearly every skeptical scholar grants them as facts. And you can take just those facts and build a very strong historical case for Jesus' resurrection. So yeah, I think there's some really good evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. He said, okay, Mike, so if Jesus rose from the dead, is Christianity true? Yes. So here's the thing, Mike, we've got some evidence and there's reasons to believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the gospels, but let's just say they didn't for the sake of argument. If Jesus rose from the dead, would Christianity still be true if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't write the gospels? I said, well, yeah. He said, then why are you allowing this to raise up doubts to the degree that you're questioning whether Christianity itself is true? I thought, you know, I never thought of it that way, but that makes sense. And so we went through a couple more things like that. And every time he'd say, well, did Jesus rise from the dead? Mm -hmm. uh, well, what about all the co contradictions in the Gospels? Mike, did Jesus rise from the dead? Um, what, would if Jesus rose from the dead, would Christianity still be true if there were errors in the Bible? Yeah, okay. So, but what about the genocide text in the Old Testament? Mike, did Jesus rise from the dead? <laughs> And it's like, yeah, you know, if Jesus rose, game, set, match. It's over, Christianity wins, period. And there's nothing that would be in the scriptures that the skeptics raise that uh, would discredit Christianity if Jesus rose from the dead. Um, so that was a life-changing phone call for me. It didn't stop my doubts. I still doubted um, even later. Um, I ended up doing doctoral research. And whereas a... 20 page double spaced paper with a few footnotes in grad school would have been a nightmare for me. Uh, my doctoral dissertation was about three and a half to four times the size of an average doctoral dissertation. It was about, it was over 500 pages, single spaced with over 2000 footnotes. I mean, I was obsessed with this. And, you know, asking a lot of really tough questions and willing to go, honestly, really willing to go where the evidence pointed. I mean, you can attest to that. Mm -hmm. um, so can just a few of my closest friends that I, I shared how serious an investigation this was for me. I mean, it was, it was heart-wrenching um, because I wanted to get the truth and follow it no matter where it led. Because I, I learned that I didn't have to fear truth. What I had to fear was that my biases would get in the way and prevent me from discovering truth and it cost me eternity. And that's the kind of stuff that kept me up at night. So I was willing to go wherever the, wherever the evidence led. Um, so um, I found that a lot of my doubts was a, a, a result. So initially they were, because, they were intellectual doubts. Later on, they ended up being emotional doubts. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, I came to understand this a few years ago. Uh, you know, I, I, I speak a lot, uh, travel around the country, even outside the country at times, speaking at conferences. Um, I've had, at this point, 32 public debates. Um, I've had, uh, I speak at, at churches and things like that. So a lot of times, anybody who speaks or performs music or, you know, they're up on stage, a lot of times on the stage, you'll see these uh, pieces of tape that are, have marked various areas on the stage. And the crew will tell you, stage crew will tell you, you know, this marks, these pieces of tape mark where the lighting stops. So you don't want to go on the other side of that tape because the stage lights will not light you up anymore. So, you know, it's usually like maybe a 20 foot long uh, by maybe eight feet wide, plenty of space to walk around on stage. 
you know, I could walk, never go, you know, outside those markers. I could run backwards uh, with my eyes closed. I could do cartwheels on the stage and stay within those markers. Then, you know, I, I thought about it one day. What if you were to take a plank that was eight feet wide, same width, but longer, maybe a hundred yards long, and suspend it between two skyscrapers 500 feet above the ground and say, okay, Mike, well, you can do cartwheels. Why don't you do cartwheels on this? You know, no way. Why don't you walk across it? No way. You know, if I'm doing anything on it, I'm getting on my belly and just crawling, you know, but I wouldn't even do that. Well, why not? You know, you can do it. Yeah, I know I could do it. I have the ability to do it, but what would keep me from doing it is the what if. What if I didn't do it? What if I messed up and fell off? I'd go 500 feet straight down to my death. It wouldn't be pleasant. And so I've looked at the evidence, serious evidence, for several decades. Um, I've debated some of the toughest skeptics in the world. And I know the evidence points to the truth of Christianity. But there's always that lingering question that says, what if I'm wrong? What if I missed something? That's the kind of stuff that plagues me, keeps me up at night on occasion. That's the kind of, but those aren't intellectual doubts, those are emotional doubts. There are two different kinds of doubts. So the first was, you know, initially, do we have enough evidence to show that Christianity is true? But then that turned into the emotional doubts, the what if kind. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what happened there. So then after the resurrection, then you went on to um, research for several years, gospel contradictions. Yeah. I think you recommended I did that because um, I had debated Bart Ehrman twice. He and I have become friends since. Um, and he's a, one of the leading skeptics in North America, probably the most influential skeptical New Testament scholar in North America. And um, Bart would always, in our, our debates on the resurrection, he'd go after the Gospels and mention Gospel differences. And he's got this spiel that he goes, you know. Depends on which gospel you read. Yep. You can, we could almost say it verbatim, you know. And that was really shaking the faith, rattling the faith of a lot of believers I was, with whom I was coming in contact. And um, so, you know, I, I once again, once I, you realize Jesus rose from the dead, it's like, well, I don't, you know, we can probably resolve a lot of these differences, but even if we couldn't, Christianity is still true. So it's not going to keep me up at night. But it kept a lot of believers up. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, you suggested that I, uh, you know, research that further. And I did and spent eight years doing it. I just, it became, I became obsessed with it. And it uh, uh, came out with a book, um, 2017, Why Are There Differences in the Gospels? So any of you that may be struggling with doubts because of gospel differences, that, that could be a book. However, I will say it's an academic book. It's kind of dense. Uh, not as big as the other one, but it is it is dense uh, reading, that is. And now I'm working on a popular level version of that. That should be out maybe two years, 2021. Of course, I I did read that book, and I'm a former worship leader, and I was there. You understood it. Yep, you got through it. There you go. <laughs> so, good point. Um, you know, the fact that I doubted for years, and still do on occasion... Um, but it's emotional doubt now. It, it's just the way I'm wired. But my dad never really understood that. And a lot of people, you know, as we read some of these comments on Marty's Instagram account, a lot of people don't understand doubt and doubters. You know, we're just wired this way. We don't like it necessarily, especially those of us who would experience emotional doubt. You know, those who have intellectual doubt, you can get the answers and then your doubts will go away. But if you have emotional doubt, though, emotional doubt, uh, those doubts will come back every once in a while. Um, but, you know, my dad never understood that. He was a die-hard Calvinist, five-pointer. If there were a ten-point Calvinist, he would have been one. Uh, he was a, a hyper-Calvinist, actually. And he said, you know, if you're a believer and the Holy Spirit's worked in your heart, you're going to be 100% certain. I was like, Dad, I'm not 100% certain about anything. Not, in fact, it's hard for me to make decisions at times over stupid things like, what cologne to purchase, you know, years ago, or what watch to buy, or some, you know, things like that, you know, so. Um, I don't and, shop with Mike. Yeah, she, she won't. Uh -huh. she, she doesn't like to shop with me, and I, I can understand why. But I mean, it's just the way we're, we're wired, and, um, but my dad couldn't understand that. In fact, a few years before both my parents died, uh, he canceled a Christmas trip. You know, one time he asked me, uh, uh, several years ago, I was telling him about doubts, and he said, well, how sure are you Christianity's true? I said, well, 
about 80%, 80%, you know, and it's like, uh, he just couldn't, he got mad at me for that. And it just stewed in him for several years. We didn't talk about it for a few, several years, but we invited him to visit us in the Atlanta area for Christmas. And they originally agreed and then he canceled it because he was so upset that a few years before that, I'd said I was only 80% certain Christianity was true. And I, a little more now, of course, but um, you know, I was struggling with doubts at that point. Um, so, I mean, it was like that for and a long then, time. And then he, then he prayed that God would take you out of ministry <laughs> because of that. Yeah. And then he got a not so pleasant email from me. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember you told me you'd sent that after you sent it. Yeah. And, uh, but your mom was really happy that I sent it. She was. Because I said a lot of things that she had wished that she could say, <laughs> but was afraid to. <laughs> but anyway. Well, for those of you who might be doubting, I just want to say a couple of points. Doubting is, the first, doubting is normal. When you come to the Old Testament, we find that Abraham doubted, and yet he became the, he, he makes it into the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11. In fact, if anything, he's the most valuable player. Later on, you have John the Baptist. Gary Habermas pointed this out to me years ago. John the Baptist, he was like, for a while, he was Jesus' wingman and pointed to Jesus, baptizes him, you know, the Holy Spirit comes down as a bird, bird on him, and he hears a voice from heaven about Jesus being his love, beloved son. And um, later on, John the Baptist is in prison. And I'm sure the conditions weren't good, and it's like nobody's coming to defend him or get him out. Jesus is still doing his own thing, and so John starts to experience some doubts. And he sends some of his disciples to Jesus and to ask him, are you the one or are we to expect someone else? So he's doubting. And Jesus basically does some miracles and reminds his disciples of the miracles he did, had done. Uh, Go back and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind see, the deaf, uh, uh, deaf hear, the paralyzed are, are walking, the dead are raised, and the gospel is preached to the poor. Blessed are those who do not stumble and account of me. So provides evidence, the miracles. He encourages him. Blessed are those who, uh, happy are those who do not stumble and account of me. And then once his disciples leave, now here's where the rubber meets the road. And I think this is cool because now we're gonna find out what Jesus thinks of doubters. And he says to all the other people around as they're looking at him, I mean, it's like your wingman has just, he's doubting. It's an embarrassing moment for Jesus. And what does he say about John? When you came out in the wilderness to see John, what did you come out to see? I'll tell you who you came to see, a prophet, a great prophet. In fact, no greater person has been born of woman than John the Baptist. Can you think of a better compliment to pay someone? And Jesus is doing this while John the Baptist is doubting. That's an amazing example to us on how to treat doubters. But it also is to tell us doubters that if Abraham can doubt, if John the Baptist can doubt and Jesus can respond to John that way, and he's not mad at John, then he's not mad at us either when we doubt because he understands we are frail humans with idiosyncrasies. We are but dust. And he understands that. I love that story about John the Baptist doubting. It, it's really helped me over time. And some of us, like I said, are just more wired to doubt. Uh, C.S. Lewis was that way. He was once asked on the BBC if he ever doubted. Uh, now that he's a Christian, he says, yeah, I, I doubt on occasion. But he says, I gotta be honest, when I was an atheist, I doubted a, a, a occasion as well. Wondering if Christianity was true. The famous atheist philosopher, Anthony Flew, um, Gary Habermas told me this years ago, he, he and, and and Flew were friends, good friends. Um, and he once said, hey, Tony, do you ever doubt your atheism? And he said, Gary, I doubt my atheism every day. And this is when he's one of the most influential atheist philosophers in the world. So some of us are just wired this way. We're gonna doubt no matter what we believe. We're gonna second guess, we're gonna triple guess. We don't like that idiosyncrasy. It's just the way we are. Another major point I'd make is uh, concerning uh, the best way to respond to someone who's doubting. What is the best way? Well, I'd say, let's take the example of Jesus. He provided evidence. He, he um, encouraged him and, and he complimented him. And someone who's doubting, not because they want to get out of Christianity, because they want to cheat on their wife 
or do something else for moral reasons. I'm talking about people who are, they're sincere about their doubts. You know, you want to provide evidence and, and you want to be loving brothers and sisters in Christ, not sarcastic and demeaning like we see a lot of these, these posts that are going on about and how doubters are being treated. That's just an ungodly response. Um, it's easy to do it because it's social media and, you know, we, we just don't think yeah. a lot. I have to wonder whether, whether some of these folks would have made those comments had, had they been face-to-face -face with Marty yeah. and not on social media. I kind of wonder about that. Yeah, we need to keep in mind that God is going to hold us as, as followers of Jesus accountable even for just our idle words. You know, we're, we have to give account for our words, whether that's vocally or on the keyboard. And sometimes like our guards can be down, but we gotta watch what we say. And what we say should be edifying, shouldn't be to tear someone down and, and to judge them. So let's not rebuke doubters for doubting. Let's not downplay their doubts. Uh, the questions Marty and others are asking, many others are asking are, are difficult questions and they're deserving of thoughtful, reasonable answers. And the answers are there. You know, I've looked at the stuff for more than three decades uh, and wrestled with it. The answers are there, uh, but you do have to spend some time to, you know, look at it. A lot of college stuff. students are asking these questions. Yes, they are, are. Aren't they? I get emails all the time about college students and even older adults who are saying, watch one of your debates, watch your lecture man, you saved my faith, or I became a Christian as a result. So, um, you know, we need to be authentic and give authentic, reasonable answers. It's, it's very important. Uh, we need to give people uh, as well the freedom to doubt without rebuking them for doing so. Look, the disciples doubted. They'd been with Jesus. They saw him do miracles. He predicted his death and resurrection. And yet it seems like with the possible exception of John, the son of Zebedee, None of the disciples believed the testimony of the women that the tomb was empty because Jesus had been raised. They had to see Jesus to change their mind. We don't get that, you know? So uh, it, the disciples, you know, Jesus says, blessed are those who have seen and believed, but I'm sorry, you've seen and believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. But we've got evidence that we can, tangible evidence that we can present today and, and we should. Um, another thing, major point, is what should those who do who are doubting? So we talked about what, how, what's the best way to respond to doubters. What about those who are doubting? What should they do? Well, one thing is they should realize that absolute certainty is an unreasonable expectation. Because those of us who doubt understand that you can't be absolutely certain about anything. Uh, we can't be absolutely certain that we weren't born or created just five minutes ago with memories in our minds of things that never occurred and food in our stomachs of food of meals we never ate. We can't prove that that's not the case. So um, we can be reasonably certain, but we can't be absolutely certain. And so we shouldn't be seeking for absolute certainty that Christianity is true or that Jesus rose, um, you know, in order to confirm our faith. Um, I would say learn as I did with the Baltimore call, learn to put these matters in their proper perspective. So the matter of gospel authorship is important, the matter of contradiction is important, the matter of creation, uh, genocide in the Old Testament, you name it, uh, problem of evil, all these things are important. However, if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true, period. And we need to keep that in mind. And these other things, though important, they wouldn't change the fact that Christianity is true if Jesus rose from the dead. So we can search these things, but I, I find a tendency as I talk to people that they will take all these different questions and they let all these questions build up into a huge, like their heads are swimming with doubts and they just need to put these things into perspective, you know? So I, I think that's important. Um, I'd say get information. If you're doubting, get information. Read, don't be lazy about this. Read, watch videos. And don't, be discriminant in the videos you watch. Be discriminant in what you read. Sometimes you can turn, you know, publishing on the World Wide Web does not make you a world-class scholar. The only credential that you need to publish on the web is you have to breathe, you know? <laughs> and you don't even have to be able to type since there's speech rec voice recognition software. Um, so look for what scholars are saying. 
uh, people who are credentialed in the area. There are people out there saying Jesus never existed. It's really hard to find a credentialed scholar that will say that. I'm not saying they're not out there. There are, there are a handful of them. But there are more credentialed scientists who think the world is less than 20,000 years old than there are credentialed historians who think that Jesus never existed. And yet, this is something that goes around the internet and, and people are just, their faith is like shaken because of this stuff. So read what scholars are saying, not just what internet bloggers who have no credentials on this. And it's gonna take some time, but your faith is worth it, isn't it? Don't have a lazy faith, have a reasonable faith. Um, get some information, like I said, you can come to my website, risenjesus.com. Um, I've got an article in there. I'm a doubting Thomas. I wrote this thing, I think about five years ago, and I explained about the doubting process and what you can do to overcome it. You can go to my YouTube channel. Uh, just go to YouTube, go to Mike Licona, L-I-C-O-N-A, and uh, just type in, you know, go to the search, the, the uh, magnifying glass field, and type in doubt, and you'll find three things come up, two videos and then one that's an audio podcast, um, and that can help on doubt. You know, you can, there's various books out there, great books. I don't even want to begin, you know, talking about who they're by because there's so many of them, so, so many of my colleagues in the field of apologetics, Christian apologetics, but great stuff. There's really a lot of stuff. I've written a book on the resurrection. I don't want to be self-promoting here, but I've got a book a little over 700 pages long on the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, and it is readable for most people. Um, Gary Habermas and I wrote a book together, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. That's very readable, and that will answer probably 90% of the kind of questions that are out there today. Um, I guess I would also say, I'd recommend that if you're doubting, don't share your, your doubts on social media. That's probably not the best thing to do. Um, Psalm 73 was something that spoke to me years ago when I was experiencing doubts. The psalmist was doubting because he saw a lot of wicked people who were living carefree lives of wealth and just everything going their way, and they were just living these wicked lives. And yet the righteous were not living a, a, a lives that were, you know, they were being persecuted, they were suffering sicknesses and things like this, uh, even being persecuted by the wicked. And it's like he's looking at this and saying, well, why is it? Well, this is a waste living a life for God. It's not given me anything. And he goes on to say in Psalm 73, verse 15, he says, if I had spoken out like that, shared his doubts and his thoughts, I would have betrayed your children because he could cause them to stumble. I think we have to watch out for this. Jesus says something about causing uh, other believers to stumble, something about a millstone. You know, it's not good. Um, I would say if you're, if you're doubting, choose a handful of people you respect uh, with whom you can talk and, and confide in them and work through those doubts. Um, one other verse I'll give is Romans chapter 14, verse 13, and it applies to both doubters and those who interact with doubters. Paul says, let us stop passing judgment. Okay, so you who are talking to doubters, stop passing judgment on us doubters, okay? And he says, but decide instead not to put a stumbling stone or obstacle in the way of a brother. And I think that's something for us doubters to be thinking about. We wanna make sure that as we're handling these things, don't put a stumbling block in front of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't wanna do that. Um, One yeah. thing that, that I think, um, as far as sharing your doubts on social media, um, it really opens a person up for um, a lot of junk mm. and um, creates a lot of noise coming in when, when a doubter is trying to work through their doubts. When, as you say, they should be um, doing their research uh, by reading scholars on both sides mm -hmm. of the issue. But when they get on social media, then they're getting so much garbage in and it's creates so much noise and then emotional upheaval and just noise that I think it can just make things harder. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. It's like comments like we read at the beginning. Yeah. That doesn't help. It's not helpful you at know, all. Those are immature believers 
and who are saying these some of these really sarcastic, demeaning things. If you're a mature believer, you're not saying these kind of things. Or, or maybe just ill-informed with, those were just mean. They're mean, but yeah. Some, some of the comments weren't necessarily mean. They're, they're well-intentioned, but just misinformed. Yeah. Or there are people who don't struggle with doubt. And for them, it's just, just get in the word, just pray more, and that works for them. But for somebody who's really struggling with intellectual questions, that's not going to work for them. Yeah, well, I can tell you that. <laughs> that's as a doubter, I can I can verify that. Um, I think something you pointed out earlier to me this morning is all of this just reinforces the need for apologetics, Christian apologetics, in the church today, which is something that lacks in most churches, um, even churches with high views of scripture a lot of times don't do anything to train our children as they're going through middle school and high school on why Christianity is true. You know, we can talk about, hey, the Bible's God's word, but well, why is it God's word? You know, how do we know it is? Why should we think it is? Why should we believe the stuff in it? And if we're not doing that, they go off to college and that's where you're going to get slammed. Yeah, or you just start thinking about some of these difficult questions. A lot of the the panic that seemed to set in with with um, what was going on with Marty was, you know, people are going to be influenced to give up their faith. Um, well, you know, we need to be more equipped, equipping people to be more grounded in their faith, and and I think apologetics is one way to do that. Yeah. If people give up their faith because someone they respect in the faith that you know doubts or leaves, they didn't have much of a faith. Right. It was based on emotion. It wasn't grounded. You know. I think so. as a church we need to be more responsible to be equipping the body. Absolutely. Well, if you are out there and you are interacting with doubters, or you are a doubter. Um, we hope that this short video has been helpful to you. Um, we can just wish you uh, God's blessing as you, for those of you who are doubters, God's blessing on you as you search. And um, the answers are there. You just have to look for them, be open-minded, persist. And uh, hey, we love you. God bless you.